Hey Libby, how are you doing? Thanks for helping me out today. No problem, Deb. Nice to see you. Yeah, so uh, give me some of these questions that people have asked over the years. Okay, question number one. What is your background in writing comedy? Well, that's a good one because people assume I've written a lot of television. Mostly though, I've written for the stage. Uh, I've done stand-up plays. And I have done a bit of TV over the years. I wrote for a couple of comedy shows like uh, Red Green's uh, show called uh, Go Girl. I've done a ton of radio. I've been on CBC radio doing the debaters, but I've also had three comedy specials featured there. And a lot of my articles have been aired on the CBC. I also have three books, which I self-published. Um, and two of them are just essays and the other one's a novel that I started and did. And, I've also had my own columns in uh, magazines um, like Kingston Life and contributed to Reader's Digest, Canadian Living, and more magazine. And I'm 100 years old, so I'll stop there. Amazing. Okay, so you have written for the stage and the page then. Is mm -hmm. there a huge difference between writing for those two mediums? Well, I, I really believe so, because with the written word, the page has to do all the work. And for me as a speaker, that was really hard for me to convert to the page because it's hard, blank, emotionless page. And all your words have to create all the mood, the emotion, the character, the plot. And a page, you might be crying while you write, but that page doesn't know <laughs> all the meaning that you're signifying on it unless you use great imagery and writing. Um, so just in a simple mathematical term you need a lot more words for the written word like an average book is about a hundred thousand words and an average play is about twelve thousand words and a 70 minute stand-up is about seven thousand words so you see like the job of the written word is different and on stage you have your voice the body language you have sometimes a set a lighting designer a director and you've got a bunch of people helping you shape that whole visual and then on top of that you know when you're performing you have that audience who is a part of the information because there's a back and forth dialogue between them and you and uh, one thing about an audience is they will tell you it's working or not and that can be good and bad because um, sometimes the audience are in bad moods and your job is to entertain them and when you're writing and you're still developing your work for something in front of an audience, I've found it the most challenging not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just sacrifice it because that audience didn't like me. Um, I try not to blame the audience and say, oh, they just didn't get me. Um, but often I haven't done the work yet that's allowing them to see the, the joke in the right way. And I have to do a lot of rearranging. You do that with the written word too, but you're often doing that on your own. Um, and from the audience, it doesn't mean that the joke is bad if they don't like it. You just have to rearrange it and see if you've got the structure right. I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have to get the math right. You know what I mean? Like the structure is the math with comedy on the stage too. And so what do, what do you mean by that, get the math right? Well, I come from old school comedy. I know there's different styles of comedy. But if you're just going to go with jokes, and even comedy has a math to it, um, it's constructed uh, very, it builds on each other. So you have to have ideas that will build so that the last idea is the funniest. And so, um, I don't know, like I've always said, you have to sometimes really get clean with jokes. Like sometimes I've had too many ideas in one joke. So I'm kind of like, uh, is that Maria Conde? Marie Conde, I have to declutter. And um, sometimes I have to do things like just go, that's a really funny idea, but it was too long for the audience. Uh, you know, long way to go for the audience and there wasn't enough payoff. Um, the other thing about the math of it is people watch a lot of TV, they watch a lot of YouTube videos and TikTok and they know what they think is funny. So if they get ahead of you, you have to constantly try to, you know, be ahead of them and end your joke on the ideas, the funniest idea. Um, as I say, when you're in front of an audience, they will tell you that really quickly. But when you're on the page, it's a harder job to do that on the page. Sometimes you have to, you know, get it out in front of people that find you funny.
and get them to uh, listen to you, read it, et cetera. So it doesn't come out of the gate. Perfect. Well, no, no, gosh, no. Sometimes it looks like it's just natural, but that's because I've worked it over and over again. And, um, you know, I've had jokes where people have told me, oh, I hate that joke. I don't like that joke. It's too gross. Or one woman told me a joke about speeding I had in my show forever. I can't remember it at the moment. But she didn't like the joke, but it ended up being my best joke. So, but it was I hadn't got the structure of the joke right. So um, it, it actually ended up being one of my funniest bits. Uh, so, yeah, you have to work on it. And um, uh the other part about this is when, you know, you say it doesn't come out of the gate perfectly. I think it's really the challenge with any writer, whether you're writing comedy or drama, is to know, um, you know, is this section needed? And you can't always trust yourself as an editor, so you need other eyes on it. But one little tip I have is if I can't remember a section of my comedy act or every time I go to say it, I trip over it, it's usually my writing. Um, when I've written plays, there's always a section in my play where the actor can never remember those lines. And I'm like, it's got to do with the writing and I have to simplify it so it can stay in there. I have a whole pile of files, of sections of jokes and books <laughs> and stories I've got that, you know, just didn't fit into what I was writing. I don't know when I'm ever going to go back for it. You have to let them go, though. Mm -hmm. So if you love something, set it free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it comes back to you, then you have to edit the shit out of it, basically. <laughs> um, and what about writing comedy for the page? Well, yeah, because I mean, the one thing about comedy on the page is it's a solitary act. You write alone. Uh, I know it's funny when I laugh out loud or I think, oh my God, I can't say that. That's when I know the idea is hitting the right button. And I have to trust that. Um, I also know I overwrite for the page sometimes. And then when I get it up on its feet, I'll cut a bunch of words. But when you write for the page, you're by yourself. And, and even the reader is by themselves reading your work. And uh, so, you know, it's really harder. You really have to have a lot of confidence in yourself. Um, I just want to say, when you are writing for the page, I'm very careful who I will listen to. Um, because I've just written a book and, you know, I had a friend read 320 pages of my book and say, you know, on page four, uh, there were spelling mistakes. And I'm like, that's true. And you're going to be great for me when I get to publish it. But right now I need to know, does the story work? And then there's people that, you know, today are like, you can't say that about salary, that, tr you know, salary's triggering. And I'm like, okay, that's your stuff. And then I have to go back and I ask myself, well, did three people that read it say the same thing? And then I listen. But if people laugh, then I know I've got the joke right, even on the page. People say, I laughed my head off. I, I'm laughing. You know, people say, I'm laughing in the tub. I, my husband wants to know why I'm laughing. He's borrowing my book. And then I go, OK, I've got the voice right. And do you think comedy is harder to write than drama? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's more demanding. It's a brutal taskmaster, because you know faster if comedy's not working. I mean, when I read bad drama, it takes me a minute because I think, well, maybe this person is too deep for me or maybe I'm stupid. But with comedy, I know whether I like it or not, you know? And I mean, obviously we all have our own separate taste in comedy, but a bad joke will just <laughs> die, you know? And you'll just see the people like looking at their watches. Whereas if you're watching, you know, Edgar Allan Poe and there's a ballet dance, you're going, you know, you don't recognize it as bad. It takes a while to go, oh, I don't know why this isn't working for me. Comedy, you know, immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in your classes, you say drama is serious and comedy is deadly serious. Um, what does that mean? Well, I think you can't wink at your reader when you're writing and tell them like, I'm really clever here as a joke meister. I think you have to uh, play it deadly serious and exaggerate the seriousness of it. Um, and when I say you have to tell the truth, it, it has to, there has to be a truth to it so the audience can understand what you're mocking. And when I say truth, I don't mean just facts, like this is what really happened. And then, you know, this happened in real life. And I always say no one cares whether it happened in real life. Um, 
if it's not funny, then it doesn't work. But yeah, the truth is really important, like situational humor, observational humor, stand up, even that has to be grounded in some kind of emotional truth or after a few minutes, the audience just tunes out. And then they, and also they get rather suspicious of everything you do is uh, just the joke and the punchline because then they're gonna not take you seriously and you've got to hook into them emotionally in order for them to engage with you, I think, yeah. Yeah. That okay. makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, it does. I love that. I love that deadly comedy being deadly serious. Yeah. Um, I think people think like, I remember once I was directing at Second City and uh, we had people come in and audition from the theater world, the serious theater world. And they, we had like little sketches and, you know, we play those sketches deadly serious and the sketch and situation is what's funny. And somebody came in and they did uh, Cyrano de Bergerac with a Groucho Marx nose and glasses on and spoke in a bigoted Asian accent. And, I, and it was bad back then. And, and I said to the guy, the Cyrano de Bergerac monologue where he talks about his nose is so funny. Why didn't you just do it like that? And he goes, oh, but I thought it had to be funny, you know? And I'm like, no, that monologue is absolutely hilarious and painful, yeah. you know? So yeah. yeah, you have to be, I think you have to get to the truth as a writer first, and then you can elevate it uh, up to comedy. Not every time, but that, that's a one way to do it, yeah. I love that. Um, okay, next question. Are all your jokes based on true situations? Well, they're inspired a lot of times. So I have to say, I just love it when I just can write a joke for fun. But normally what I do is I take a bit of the truth and then I elevate it or twist it. And um, ironically, the jokes where I have totally constructed a comedic situation and I've really worked on that structure, people go, oh, I have an uncle just like that. I know your uncle. And I'm like, no, you don't, because he's invented. Um, the more I talk about my family on stage, but that's not my family. It's a composite of everyone's family and some of my relatives. And uh, yet people think I'm telling the absolute truth to that. But what I've got the truth of is um, the way people sound or the way people behave. And when people say to me, um, it's like you came into my kitchen and heard me talk to my kids. I'm like, then I hit the truth because all families have that kind of dynamic. Your actual details will be different than mine, but I've hit the truth for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a, the real situation gets sparked, uh, sparks new ideas, and then you exaggerate and take them a bit further. Cool. Okay, so um, in class, you talk about the three E's. Can you explain what those are? Yeah, it's kind of what I'm talking about. You take the truth, and then the three E's of comedy are emotion, exaggeration, and elevation. I'll just give you like a true story that I built a joke around. Like my mother took a pant, pant making course, true. You know what happens when you take a pant making course? You stare at people's crotches. That was true too. If the crotch frowns, the crotch is too, sorry, if the crotch frowns, the pants are too big. And if the crotch smiles, the pants are too tight. That was also true. And then the joke is I took her to see Mama Mia and she couldn't focus on the performance because Louise Petrie's crotch was smiling at her all through Dancing Queen. So I take parts of the truth of what my mother has said to me over the years and then I exaggerate. Now, by the way, she does go to theater and look at people's crotches when she went to theater. <laughs> so I just consolidated that. Yeah, so there's, there's truth, but then you exaggerate and you make the emotion bigger. So I exaggerate the importance of the pants, I exaggerate my mother's emotion around it. And then I, I create a punchline. And usually the punchline isn't the truth part. Okay. And now I just kind of covered uh, the exaggeration part. So I guess we don't have to do that again. Um, yeah. Do you think yeah. that a joke always has a, like a surprise element in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a surprise or the audience is so excited that they were thinking the same thing and you said it. So sometimes it's like an instant recognition of like, oh my God, that's perfect. But again, you have to be faster than them and say something that seems perfect, but um, 
you know, I think a lot of times you say the thing you shouldn't say, and that's what makes the audience laugh. Like a surprise is um, that things look a certain way and then they get twisted. Like the other day I, I was, uh, you know, I've been really kind of like on my game. I was really zen. I've done yoga, breathed with Tara Brock. And I was leaving my apartment and this guy comes in the building and he's like got a bicycle. He starts, go, 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 go. And he's trying to get me to go through the door. And I go, no, you have no mask. And he goes, go dear, go. Well, someone calls me dear. And I'm like, don't you call me dear. And I, you fucking idiot. So yeah, <laughs> like that's the surprise. You're not expecting a 64 year old woman who's just been spiritual to act like that. Yeah. Um, that it surprised makes, him and me, you know? Surprised him, yeah. And you. <laughs> um, I love it that. surprised me because I thought I wasn't going to act like that. So the humor also came from me for the next 10 minutes trying to think if he came back on me what I could have pretended I said. Like, oh, I didn't okay. say F you. I said, shut up. I had like, uh, yeah. yeah. So the humor is the surprise of how you think a person's going to act. I love that. Um, okay, do you worry if your ideas um, offend people? Like they're gonna offend people? Yeah. Yeah, well, yes. Um, yeah, I used to always sort of be in the audience's lap trying to figure out what they wanted me to say, but um, I think today there is a real responsibility with comics to, you know, um, make what they're saying you know, punch up, be as smart as it can be. Because I don't think, I think the things we said at Second City years ago, like, we, oh my God, we would have been canceled. I mean, we just said things that we thought were clever, but it was really putting some kinds of groups down. Um, and then we left them down. We didn't elevate them in the next joke and make them be right, right? So uh, actually I was listening to uh, comic, uh, you know, Seth Rogen. And he had this great line. He goes, people talk about, Louis C.K. who got canceled. And they go, he got canceled for his jokes. And that's absolutely false. He didn't get canceled for his jokes. He got canceled for sexually lewd acts in front of women that didn't want those acts. And then Dave Chappelle, he got all in trouble for his jokes about LGBTQ. He didn't get canceled. He's still popular than ever, but he got called out. And so I think we need to look, we don't have to like pussyfoot around all these difficult topics, but we have to look at and call out our own bias and sometimes poke at the sacred cow. And if, you know, if you're a left-wing hippie like me, you gotta poke at that liberalism and poke and, and play both sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. um, also, I wanna say one thing if I could back up. Um, like if you're a new writer, usually you're just always second guessing yourself. So there's no particular situation um, that you're gonna think of that someone else hasn't thought of it. I think you have to, uh, remember that you're not the first person to have that thought. You write it down and then you check it out with people and you see if that joke resonates, especially if it's a delicate topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, okay, and then when you were putting together um, your latest show, you and I ran lines and there were um, LGBTQ plus jokes, you weren't sure. Um, and you weren't sure that they struck like the right chord. I think we worked on that vagina line for what, 40 minutes? I think, yeah. I don't think I've ever said the word vagina so many times. I definitely I have not. A woman. <laughs> so, you know, you really helped well, me yeah. with that because I kept asking you because you're from a different generation where there's a lot more awareness of the language. Was I stepping on anyone's toes? Was the joke on the right thing? Was it on just, the trans person or the, the situation, or was I taking the hit? And I think in this particular case, we, we really did get the right perspective because it was based on how silly I was as opposed to their uh, silliness, right? And how uncomfortable and tripping over my feet. And the more I tried to understand the worse that God, I think that's where the funny came from. And, you know, I have to tell you, um, when I did the preview in Toronto, a couple of LGBTQ plus people thanked me afterwards for getting that right. And I thought, well, now I wouldn't have done this when I was younger, but now I think the person I'm mocking or making fun of, would I be comfortable if they were in the room? And if I'm not, I work on it until I am. 
Um, and by the way, I think one thing, even if you're writing a blog, not just doing stand up, you can go into the audience's head for a minute and call out what you think they're going to say, like, slow down, you know, I'm a white woman saying these jokes. I get you. You're worried I'm going to get racist. Like, call it out so you can mock how uncomfortable we all are talking about that. I call that playing the devil's advocate. And you argue the opposite side to let people know that you know what they're thinking. It's a great technique as a comic, but it really works in blogs and short stories, too. Mm hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. Do you think that comics think differently than other people? Well, I think writers do. Um, but I think comics, because especially we speak our, our, uh, our medium faster than we write it, is we miss nothing. Like we're always thinking like what's happening. Like, you know, if you came in and you had like one little thing wrong with your body, we'd be like, oh, you've got you know, lint all over your shirt. Like we'd notice everything. So we're kind of hyper vigilant, and we're always thinking like we're looking at the reality and we're always thinking, what if this happened? And oh my God, what if that happened? And we're always, we're always doing those three E's in our head. Like even when I was swearing at that guy, I'm already thinking of telling my son and how my son's going to have to protect me. And I'm doing a whole shtick in my head and this guy's moved on with his life, but that's what comics do. Um, so I think it's different that way. But I do think writers are like that too. Writers notice a lot of stuff other people wouldn't notice. I love that. Yeah. Uh, do you think that that can be taught? You mean to, to notice? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I think what a dramatic person might notice and what a comic might notice, they would be different and they would be slightly played differently. But I hope it can be taught because I've been charging these people money for this. Um, seriously, though, I think um, what I really teach is people to observe the details and then let their natural sense of humor come through. And if their pieces in my class have humor to them, I can help them elevate the structure to make it the funniest story it can be. So that's, uh, that's about it for me. Yeah, that's what I do. And that's about the end of all of our questions. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. You made it. Well, thank you. Okay.